Um, I'm Ruth Stevens. I'm a board member on the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council, and we're very uh, happy to sponsor the next, next speaker, Sophia Ward Brewer. Uh, Sophia is someone who's probably familiar to many of you. Uh, she has a long connection with the Grand Rapids Public Library, having started as a page. And eventually, um, in, in um, 2014, becoming the head of programming at the Grand Rapids Public Library. And in addition, she is currently serving on the, the Board of Trustees for the Grand Rapids Public Library. It, her current position is at Grand Rapids Community College, and where she serves as a collection development librarian. And as you will see, she's uh, developing a real interest in local history and has, has unearthed some real gems that she'll be telling you about today. Sophia? So mic check, can everybody hear me okay? I, people usually don't have trouble hearing me. I'm from Mississippi and um, down there when we went out into the country to visit uh, relatives, houses were like miles away and you felt like you had to shout every single time you said something in order for people to hear you. So if I get a little loud, it's the Mississippi in me. So today, I, 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 before I even get started, I want to thank Ruth at first for introducing me, but I also want to thank the Grand Rapids Public Library and the organizers of this event for giving me this opportunity to tell our story. But I also want to thank you. I mean, it's like, how many inches of snow out there? <laughs> And you are sitting here, so that shows dedication, that shows willingness, that shows interest. And I just appreciate that. I appreciate you being here. So today, the topic that I'm going to be talking about um, is going to be African-American women who were activists, who were crusaders for justice around the late 1800s and the early 1900s. But before I get started, I want to kind of put my talk in perspective. So imagine, this is, I'm, I'm talking about late 1800s, so think about 1890, for instance. So imagine, this is just about 25 to 30 years after the Civil War. Reconstruction had ended. This is, a, this is like middle, this is like right smack dab in the middle of Jim Crow. Smack dab in the middle of lynch them if they get out of hand. So imagine the bravery of these women to step up and crusade for justice. So as I'm going through my talk today, have that at back of mind. You might say, well, what's big about that? But then put it into context. At this time, women were fighting for the suffrage movement. They were fighting for rights. But imagine being an African-American woman. You were subhuman. They didn't care anything about, there were people in this country that didn't care anything about you. Imagine traveling on the trains and having to sit in cars that nobody should have sat in. They were going to speak all over the country and couldn't even eat in the restaurants of the areas in the um, institutions that they were speaking at. But they kept doing it. So the title of my presentation is Undercurrent. African-American women in the turn of the 20th century. And I scratched off Grand Rapids because two of the ladies that I'm going to talk about were in Grand Rapids a lot. But they didn't really stay in Grand Rapids. I can't find any residents of them being living in Grand Rapids. But they were here so often that I was like, I'm just going to include them. So to put more in context, I wanted to also give you a timeline. 
because it's sometimes hard to visualize what was happening um, during this time. So um, at the end of the timeline, you can see the 1920, when women actually earned um, the right to vote or gained the right to vote. They earned it at birth. They just didn't get it until, <laughs> <laughs> until 1920. So as you can see, I, w I, I wanted you to be able to visualize how so many people fought for the right to vote, but they never saw it. They, their lives were cut so short of getting to that point. And I also, also wanted to use this to show a little bit of, to, to put more context and to show you a little bit of what was happening on the national scene before I got into what happened locally. So on the national scenes, when you hear about the suffrage movement or the civil rights movement, you might hear names like the names at the top, Susan B. Anthony. We all kind of know and have heard about Susan B. Anthony, right? Or Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We, we know, kind of know about her. We also know because, I mean, right over in Battle Creek, we also know Sojourner Truth, right? And Frederick Douglass, who doesn't know wild hair Frederick Douglass, right? And then Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells, they were founding members of the National Association for Colored Women. So they were kind of on the national scene and talking about bravery. Think about Ida B. Wells. I mean, living in the South and writing about lynching. And then I wanted to put some in, uh, events um, into context. So you see Seneca Falls happened in, 18, um, in 1848. So that was the first women's rights convention. I wanted to put the 1851 convention up there because that was the convention where um, Sojourner Truth actually did her famous Ain't I a Woman speech. The Civil War kind of had to affect what was going on at that time. In 1870, the uh, 15th Amendment allowing all men the right to vote. All men didn't get to vote, but conceptually, all men had the right to vote. And then in 1874, the forma formation of the Women's um, Christian Temperance Union, and how that really played a big effect on how women were able to get into the political scene. That gave them an opportunity. The WCTU did that. But it also gave them the opportunity to take on leadership roles. And boy, did they. Then the Reconstruction era from 1865 to 1877. So local scene. So if we talk about the local scene, of course, we have to mention Emily Burton Ketchum. But she's not that subject today, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned her as uh, someone who fought for the suffrage movement here in Grand Rapids. The women that I'm going to primarily be looking at today are the five women at the bottom. Lucy Thurman, Emma Ford, Mary Roberts Tate, Lottie Wilson Jackson, and Hattie Beverly. And as you can see, just look at that. I mean, it's such a shame. Look at, look at the timeline. Only three people on this timeline actually saw, actually got to vote. Just let that sink in for a moment. And allow me to remember to click the next. Okay, so my first person that I'm going to be talking about is this power of a woman, Lucy Thurman. So Lucy was born in Canada, and um, Frank Thurman is actually her second husband. She was previously married to a man named William Simpson. Um, he died um, early on, and she remarried, and she had two children with William, and then two children with Frank. And looking at census records, I, I find this amazing, but I, I don't know how else to say it, but Lucy was 
had to be around 40 years old when she had, or 43 years old when she had her last child. And she was thumping the pavement then. So Lucy um, died, ooh, sorry. She died in, um, in, 18, in 1918, and she mostly lived in Jackson, um, Michigan. She, um, I found um, something that indicated that she had um, met Frederick Douglass when she was 17, and that kind of changed her life, and that's kind of when she started her activism. She met him in Maryland when she was traveling. So this, these are articles that kind of um, demonstrate Lucy's involvement with um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. Um, on the um, left-hand side of the screen um, is an announcement um, from a, a Spring Street AME church um, that Lucy was going to be speaking, speaking on um, some of the evils of the nation. This was in 1892. And she's going to be speaking about that. On the right-hand side, um, talks more about Lucy's involvement in speaking of, about the work among the colored people for, for the WCTU. And then on the bottom, she was also kind of, it kind of was a natural ducktail for a lot of the women who were involved um, in the WCTU to also be involved with the um, National Prohibition Party. And so I, um, in doing research, I ran across um, in the Library of Congress some notes from um, the National Prohibition Convention in 1892. And the candidate that won the nomination for that party had written some notes about Lucy Thurman. And so it, it, when I was searching the Library of Congress, I ran across these notes. And I kind of wanted to read you what he wrote about her. And, it, and, and he's talking, he had just won the nomination and the convention was about to end. And he says, yet it did not break up at once. This is the end of the convention, he's saying. A strong woman, a strong woman, passionate voice, arrested attention and checked the retiring host. She stood on a seat in the Michigan delegation. She was a colored lady, Miss Lucy Thurman of Jackson, Mississippi stung to the heart by the discrimination against her race at the hotels and other places of resort. She could not permit the convention to adjourn without giving utterance to the indignation that was surging within her. With flashing eyes and burning words, she denounced the white men of the North who hypocritically talked about Southern outrages and make an issue along the lines of their platform, yet refused to eat with the colored and sneered at just-minded men and women who protest against, the race of, um, against race discrimination. He, said, he goes on to say, this was the closing incident of the convention. Ms. Thurman were, Ms. Thurman's words were the last words spoken, and the last shouts were shouts of approval of her. So she was bad, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so in, um, in 1904, um, Lucy became the um, third president of the National Association of Colored Women. And um, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, she held, um, the National Convention was held in Detroit in 1906 under her leadership. And the right side of the screen is a, um, I'm trying to not get the back feet. So the right side of the screen is a, um, a article from the Detroit Free Press um, talking about how many people attended that, um, that convention. Over 300 delegates had attended that convention. And then on the left-hand side of the screen is, um, is a, um, minutes from the 1899 
Women's Convention, which was just um, the um, second one um, that happened in, I think it was uh, Chicago. And um, you can see, you might not can see it, but under where it says Vice Presidents, Lucy Thurman at that time was Vice President of, of the National Association for Colored Women. And she was um, serving under the president, um, Mary Church Terrell. So in um, 1907, the state convention was actually held right here in Grand Rapids. And um, Lucy was president at that time. Not only was she president of the uh, national um, uh, club, but she was also president of the local federal, uh, uh, the federal, I mean, the state federation too, here in, in Michigan. Excuse my missed out. Um, this convention was chaired by Emma Ford, and we're going to talk about Emma Ford in a minute. So this is Emma Ford. So Emma Ford was born in Canada as Emma Warren, but moved to Grand Rapids in 1881 um, after her marriage to Joseph C. Ford. Um, Emma had two children, Chandler and Theola. And um, according to census records and um, city directories, they at one point lived on Thomas Street, but they, uh, for the majority of the time, um, they lived on Jefferson. So Emma, like Lucy, was very active in the WCTU. She also attended the local AME, uh, AME church I can find, um, I found several articles highlighting her work as a treasurer or a secretary for the church. From what I found though, um, Lucy, I mean, Lucy was like, she spoke from the heart, but Emma, she was logical. She attacked things with data and organization and numbers. So that might be why she often found herself in the role of treasurer or secretary as an organizer for different organizations. Now, don't get me wrong though, she knew how to protest. <laughs> so um, on the uh, right hand side of the screen, um, Emma had, she started a couple of different clubs here in Grand Rapids. She was like, okay, let me just organize a club for that. And so one club she organized was uh, Phyllis Wheatley Club. And on the right-hand side, this is an article that appeared in um, the Grand Rapids Herald in 1907. And in it, Emma is protesting something that happened to her daughter at the local theater. So her daughter went to the local theater um, and purchased a ticket. And so back then, uh, the seating was divided by um, colors. Uh, so white people got to sit in the front of the theater. So there was a session for white people in the front. And black people had a session in the back of the theater. So this must have been a really good movie because everybody came and wanted to be there. And so they had sold out all the seats in, uh, in the white session. And Emma's daughter had already purchased a seat in the colored section. But because they had sold out, the white people that came in and they didn't have seats got to sit in the colored session that put, and they pushed the colored people out. So Emma wrote a, wrote a resolution protesting that happening and um, she, she wrote this, we the Phyllis Weekly Circle protest against this discrimination and that we be treated according to the rights of all citizens which is given by the laws of Michigan. So she wrote that and wanted it printed right in the paper in protest of what had happened to her daughter. On the left-hand side of the screen, and I know you can't see it, um, but I'm gonna tell you about it, um, was, um, is an article written um, on behalf of the Merit Ladies 19th Century Club. So the Merit Ladies 19th Century Club was a colored club formed here in Grand Rapids in 1894. This is two years before the National Association. So we were ahead of the time, right? And so um, this color club was formed by Mary Tate Roberts and Emma Ford herself. And so 
they originally thought it was going to be a social club, but it kind of turned into a political club. They, they, they kind of um, wanted to educate and really start to think about how to uplift the African American race at that particular time. And so this article, they are writing, this says colored women protest. They're writing in protest of an article that appeared in the paper. And so um, on that, in that third paragraph, um, Ms. Emma Ford starts to I issue enlist data. She used census records and, and numbers to make a point, make the point against whatever the article had said about African American people. So she went at it from a logical point of view. So Emma was a sought after lecturer, treasurer, and delegate. delegate. Here are a couple of examples showing how p other people valued her work. On the right-hand side of the screen is um, um, an announcement that she's going to be the grand lecturer at a um, Eastern Stars uh, um, convention here in Grand Rapids, in, in Detroit, actually. And on the left-hand side of the screen um, is really like um, the Herald letting people know that she was offered um, really a job to be a financial agent for an organization over in Indiana. And then at the bottom in 1913, she was um, appointed by Governor Ferris himself um, to be a delegate on the 50th anniversary, uh, anniversary celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation. So she was very well respected. And I think she was very likable. I think people liked her. I can find all kinds of articles about her and Joe Ford all over the country. So this is um, um, an image, and it's a real grainy image, um, but that's all we have, um, of Joe Ford and Emma Ford during um, one of their anniversaries. And as I was searching various newspapers all over the country, I ran across this one in the Pittsburgh Courier that yeah, talks about Joe Ford and Emma Ford's anniversary. So they would have been a power couple. They, they were a power couple back then, so imagine them today. So Joe Ford, a little bit about him. Um, Joe Ford um, worked um, as a cloakman um, for the Michigan Senate for 50 plus years. They, he got tagged the, na the nickname um, Senator Joe. And he was a big proponent of the Republican Party. He didn't get, he, the only reason he left the Senate was because they had lost the majority in, in 1933. He was, um, he fought in the um, Civil War on the Confederate side because he was from Virginia. He moved here, um, according to census records, about um, 1867 just two years after the Civil War. Now this is my girl here. <laughs> All of them are, but I have an affinity for Miss Mary Roberts Tate. So Mary Roberts Tate was um, born, from what I can tell, um, in Indiana. She was um, born Mary C. Roberts, and Samuel Tate is actually her second husband. And she, I could not find any evidence of her having children. And she died actually traveling, uh, or in New York in 1914, but she's um, buried here in Grand Rapids. So Mary Roberts Tate was really the spokesman for um, the Married Ladies 19th Century Club. A lot of the articles that appeared in the Herald were written by Mary Tate Roberts. Mary Roberts Tate. She was outspoken. She dared. So these are some articles um, um, about that club, and they used to publish uh, club notes all the time in the paper, so I can find a lot of this kind of stuff in the Herald um, about them. Now this article I, th I thought was a gold mine because in it, <clears throat> <clears throat> 
excuse me, is the history of the Spring Street AME Church. On that right-hand side, in that right-hand column, they kind of run down what had happened to the church. It had burned down at one time, they had moved, so it kind of runs down all the stuff that had happened to the Spring um, Street Church, uh, the Spring Street AME Church. But it also talks about when they finally purchased property in order to build their church. And it says that they um, purchased property for $750 and that they had paid down every, all of it except for $232 of that, um, of that cost. And then it says here that the balance being canceled by the, gener uh, the generosity of D.A. Blodgett. So it's a lot of history in that article there. Now this one. This one is when you can see the character of Mary Roberts Tate, and you're gonna kinda understand why I, I liked her. So this is an article um, when she had done a speech protesting um, the North at this particular time. She wanted them to stand up for, for, for black people. And so I'm gonna kinda um, read some of her quotes out of this article. She says, from the days of reconstruction, there have been continual appeal to the North for sympathy for the white South, she says, and announced with much emphasis. The South has kept its hands on the purse of the North and its heel on the neck of the Negro. She goes on to say, the North has grown silent and is holding hands off in matters pertaining to our welfare and dislikes or fears in, in to take on our cause. The North has reached the point where it is ready to echo almost anything the South chooses to assert. The result of this activity has been such that many instances the Negro in the North now finds himself deprived of facilities. So she's basically saying that because of the Southern influence, there is more segregation in the North. And she ends, kind of ends with money talks and the South knows it. So you kind of see right, why she was my favorite, right? So this is an article that I actually found in the Minnesota Appeal. And it was an article uh, that um, includes a letter to then President McKin McKinley talking about um, a lynching that happened in Lake City, South Carolina. So I think it was 1897, um, there was a postmaster, an African-American postmaster general who was assigned a teacher who was um, made postmaster general in South Carolina. Um, and so the white people, there were some white people that did not agree with this appointment. And so um, after they tried to get rid of him and couldn't get rid of him, they decided to go and um, shoot up his house. So the postmaster general, um, his last name was Baker, was killed. His infant daughter was killed by this mob. And then his wife and two other children that were in the house were severely injured. And so that hit to the heart of these women in Michigan and probably all over the country. And so they decided to write President McKinley offering a solution to the mob lynching problem in America. So one of the things they also did in this letter to President McKinley was to, um, to ask President McKinley to compensate the widower of Postmaster Baker. And they wanted them to, to compensate them in, for $40,000 because they had lost their livelihood. And this was a federal appointment for Postmaster at that particular time. And so it got to the heart of them. And at this time, when, when this letter was written, um, Lucy Thurman was president of the Michigan Federation. 
and Mary Roberts Tate was state organizer and lead lecturer. So Lottie Wilson Jackson. So Lottie Wilson Jackson actually lived in um, Bay City, Niles, that, uh, that area. Um, and she was a, an activist, an artist, and um, a world traveler. She is believed to have attended um, the Chicago Art Institute, and she traveled extensively um, representing Michigan as, as a delegate representing Michigan for many different um, organizations. And she used that as an opportunity to showcase her art. So um, Lottie Wilson Jackson was born Lottie, um, Charlotte Wilson. She was married three times. And she had um, one um, daughter who's pictured on her brooch. And um, from census records, it looked like she had a son named Daniel, but um, that child only lived for 30 days. So Lottie Wilson Jackson um, was a, um, a, 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 a big rep, um, supporter of the um, suffrage movement. And she went to many suffrage um, conventions. The um, image on the um, right-hand side is one from eight, uh, her attending the convention in 1898. And it says that she represented um, the work among uh, the suffrage and how, and how regarded among colored women. And she reported, uh, uh, wrote a paper and reported on that at that convention. And in 1899, right here, the convention started here in 1899. I think it was uh, around March 27, and it went into April. And Lottie Wilson Jackson was a delegate then at that convention. And just like I said, she traveled a lot. So she was faced with a lot of discrimination as she traveled. So um, I think this resolution that she proposed at this convention was dear and true to her heart. She posed, she posed this resolution, the colored woman ought not to be compelled to ride in smoking cars and that suitable accommodation should be provided for them. She wanted the convention, she said this on the delegation floor, and she wanted the convention to adopt this resolution. After some debate, there are reports that Susan B. Anthony herself said to, finally said that we as women are disenfranchised ourselves we cannot take on the cause of segregation and civil rights. And so her resolution was tabled. So she went on a crusade. I can see evidence of her being in Grand Rapids talking to the Phyllis Wheatley Club about um, African American clubs joining forces to fight against separate cars, the treatment of um, African-American women when they travel. So um, this is from the 1899 convention in Chicago. And you can see it says, Ms. Lottie Wilson Jackson spoke on the action taken in reference to separate coach law and mentioned the attitude taken by Elizabeth Cady Stanton in the national conventions of women's suffrages. She also read a written letter by her to the Woman's Journal. It was moved and second that we endorse the work by Mrs. Jackson in connection with the separate coach law and that, we be, that she be given our hearty support. 
So after she was, was refused at the National Association, which was really um, mostly uh, white women, she had to go and build support with the colored associations. Now, I said that Lottie Wilson Smith was an artist. And so this article <laughs> talks about this painting. This painting now hangs at the Niles Library. This is a painting that she was commissioned to repaint. It isn't uh, um, the original painting. The original painting was burned um, in a fire. And she was asked to repaint this painting. And she repainted this painting. And over here, it talks about how she went with the, um, with the representative Washington Garner um, to um, give this painting to um, President Roosevelt in 1902. She was a worldwide artist. So in, a, in addition to her, her activism, she was peddling her art too. Because <laughs> I, I see a lot of articles where it says, in on exhibit is the work of Lottie Wilson Jackson. So now, as a history detective, I, am, I don't know that I have enough corroborating evidence to tie these two things together, but I wanted to tell you about it. So in this article, it talks about Lottie Wilson Jackson's famous painting of Anna Murray Douglas, who was Frederick Douglass's wife. She was kind of enamored with Anna um, Murphy uh, Douglas. And so she, um, and so she um, uh, did a painting of her. This painting says, Artist Unknown, and I found this painting in the Library of Congress on the um, uh, Frederick Douglass's daughter's um, archives. It's Artist is Unknown. But Lottie Wilson Jackson, there's, I can find more than one article that said she painted Frederick Douglass's wife. <laughs> now, this one too. So over here it says Lottie Wilson Jackson painted Crispus Addis. This painting says artist unknown. It was said it was a painting around the time she would have been active. I see, I'm the new detective, so I don't know that I have enough corroborating evidence, but I wanted to show you. And I'm really running out of time, so I got to get through a lot of slides. So this is um, Hattie Beverly. How many of you guys have heard of Hattie Beverly? Okay. So Hattie Beverly was the first African American um, teacher here in Grand Rapids. So she was born in um, Milwaukee in 1874, and she died in 1904, just when she was 30 years old. So these, this is a, a picture of Hattie Beverly that I just got. It's like a golden thing, and I just got it from Ruth Van C. so thank you, Ruth. And so um, these are articles that are um, showing the protests of um, Hattie being, um, becoming a teacher in 1899. She did become a teacher um, at Congress Elementary School. She was the first African American teacher to do so. In 1902, she got married, and at that particular time, married women were, wasn't, really wasn't allowed to teach, so she had to step down from that position. And so I, I wanted to just kind of point out that that story made national attention. These are articles from other places, um, Washington, D.C., that they were interested in what was going on in Grand Rapids with Hattie Beverly. So um, I'm kind of closing. These are um, images of um, different social groups, African-American or colored social groups in Grand Rapids working together. So at, um, back in the early 1900s, there were five African-American social groups in Grand Rapids. 
we made up less than 1,000 of the population, but there were five social groups. And here is, at last, I think this kind of um, shows the progress that the Ladies um, Literary Club, I think this was around uh, 1907, showed an appreciation of my favorite one, Mary Roberts Tate, in that they recognized her during this event. So, sorry to rush through those last ones. I have about five minutes. So, wanted to open up the floor for questions. Yes, there I, I can find. Okay. Oh, he asked um, if there were any other documents about their speeches um, that I did not get a chance to present. Yes. Yes. I, a lot of it I found by just searching newspapers. A lot of it was in the Herald, but I found some in the Library of Congress. So if you take their names, you can search the Library of Congress and find documents. But I searched newspapers.com and a bunch of different um, places to just see whether or not um, they had um, their names in those newspapers. New York had a bunch of information about Mary Roberts Tate because she traveled there a lot speaking, so yeah. Any other questions? Right, I think they kind of eventually dissolved, although um, the Grand Rapids Study Club, which was one of the clubs um, in the early 1900s that's listed um, on, that docu on that article, is still in operation today. Where did you say Hattie Beverly taught? Congress, um, where did Hattie, um, Hattie Beverly teach? She taught at uh, Congress Elementary School. Same spot. Mm -hmm. um, I, which question am I? Yes, it was in 1907. No, um, they were asking if they got any rec recognition, remediation, remediation um, from that letter that they. If, if the surviving folks ever got anything from the work that they were trying to do. Uh, she's asking if the surviving spouse of that incident got any remediation. Not that I know of, but I, I, I didn't do extensive research on that particular incident. But that's a good question. Any other questions? Oh. Right. Right. So he talked about um, the Hattie Beverly Tutoring Center at Madison Square Church. I'm repeating it for, and that um, her legacy still lives through that tutoring services. So yes. I'm sorry, I, can, I didn't hear your question. Is it more than a coincidence that uh, a couple of these activists were from Canada where they would have had a <laughs> Yeah, and I think that kind of adds to their boldness too because they were educated in a different way. 
And so they could probably, um, they probably came in with a higher level of confidence and the ability to speak out like that. 